Uh, we are currently in a series uh, called First Things First. We're looking at the four times in the Gospels that Jesus says, do this first. Our desire is that we would live non-compromised lives in our busyness. Remarkably, Jesus in the Gospels four times says, but first do this. Week one, we talked about first cleaning the inside of the cup before the outside of the cup. Uh, second week, we talked about seeking first the kingdom of God. And today, we are picking up on something new or something that Jesus said as a third, but first. And so let me pray real quick, and then we'll jump in. Jesus, I pray that you would clothe this word in power. God, I pray that you would be here, that you would work on our hearts. You know what our hearts need. Encouragement, conviction, comfort, care. Lord, I pray that you would be working continually. We trust you, God. We thank you for your beautiful name and your son on the cross for our sins. Amen. I love leadership. Learning about leadership, studying leadership. I uh, want to be a growing leader. And uh, one of my favorite principles, absolutely favorite principles, is the 80-20 rule. I don't know if you know that 2080 rule. I actually, I should know what it's called. It's the 2080 rule. And it says that uh, 20, only about 20% of our inputs uh, account for 80% of the output. So if you think about your carpet, only about 20% of your carpet has 80% of the wear. There's no wear on the sides. There's no wear, wear under the furniture. And this rule applies, and they looked at different formats, different organizations, different things. It seems to be very true that 20% of your customers will account for 80% of the revenue. 20% of your customers account for 80% of bad reviews and things like that. And what's interesting, what that says is that not all the things that we can do, not all inputs have the same effect. Not all inputs have equal output. This is why in our home, Malvina and I have just made peace with this. But when it comes to cleaning, we have radically different philosophies. When I clean, I'm all about the stuff you can see from the street. You know, the table, the stuff you can see, that's all that matters. Now, her style, it's to clean some shelf on the bottom in a pantry. I'm like, babe, look, that doesn't have that much of an impact. Uh, it's, I get it. It's, you know, it's your idea, but that doesn't change. And so what that shows us is just not everything that we do has the same sort of impact. So let me ask you this question. What would you say this one thing could be? What input would you give, would you say, that you can inject into a relationship that would have the biggest impact? What is one thing you can do in a relationship, relationship with people, relationship with, that would even impact your relationship with God, that would instantly help, instantly turn parents' heart to their children and children's heart to their parents, heal a marriage, begin the process of healing in marriage, Heal friendships, bring freedom, bring closure, bring care. What is one thing that you can do? Well, I think there's a few things, but definitely I believe this one thing. You ready? It's this, asking for forgiveness from those we've wronged. Asking for forgiveness from those we've wronged. We should just wrap up our sermon and pray <laughs> and move on. How appropriate of a sermon and topic is this? I think this is the missing sermon. If you think about it, we do a great job as a church preaching on offering and extending and the need to give forgiveness. And praise be to God that we do so and let us do so more and more because forgiving others is hard. But I want to ask a logical question. If all of us here have wounds, if all of us here have hurt, if all of us here have something to forgive someone, who's doing the crime? Who's doing the hurt? 
that obviously the answer is the person in the mirror. Relationships are difficult, and we mess up in relationships. And we hurt, and we inflict damage, and we insult, and we destroy, and we betray, don't we? And yet I've realized at the same time that the proportion and the rate at which we ask for forgiveness is nowhere near the rate at which we sin against one another. Because it's easy to forget. It's easy to not even see that you've hurt someone. It's not easy to forget when someone hurts you. It could be a side comment that somebody never even cared to hurt you with, and you remember that for the rest of your life. Uh, but you can inflict serious damage to another image bearer of God and not even worry about it. And this is so huge, reconciliation and for asking for forgiveness as the first step of reconciliation that it makes its way into Jesus' most famous sermon called Sermon on the Mount. We pick up in Matthew chapter 5 early on, like really early on in the sermon. So Jesus, you know, he would have... in. The Matthew's gospel, Jesus would be, have earthly ministry of three years with 12 disciples and crowds. And Jesus would go from place to place. It was mostly concentrated in northern Israel. And Jesus would give what Matthew would record as five main discourses, five main sermons. Sermon on the Mount is the first one, and it is the ethics of Jesus' people. This is for Jesus' people. This is what our life is about. But I'll read just an excerpt. In verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment, but I say to you, so real quick, Jesus here is speaking as one with all authority. You know my authority? It's derivative, okay? Okay. My authority that I have to speak here today comes from the fact, and as long as I submit myself under the Word of God and do my best to transport, I'm just a vehicle of transport, the Word of God. In and of myself, I am below average, uninteresting Joe. But today, I get to stand with some authority, just putting it out there. But my authority, uh, yeah, <laughs> if you have to say that, you don't have any authority. <laughs> um, but Jesus' authority is not derivative. He's the source of authority. And he speaks as one who, who ne nobody speaks like this. And he's drawing a contrast between the law of Moses and saying, but I say. Now, Jesus, importantly, is not contradicting the law of Moses. He came to fulfill the law, not abolish the law. Jesus is working out the implications of the law. That's what the Sermon of the Mount is. Because here's what's so easy to do. When Israel heard the law, they focused on what was external. They ignored the heart. I believe the heart is in Old Testament as well. And Jesus comes and he really goes after our hearts. It's not just the external. He says, but I say to you, and there will be six of those, that everyone who is angry with his brother Many manuscripts have without cause, which makes sense. That's the context. Will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and this is our verse, and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift, therefore, before the altar and go. First, come on. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to the court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, I love this part, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Just whole wisdom, a treasure trove of wisdom for daily life. But first, reconcile. We're just going to stick and pause here for a moment. Notice what the crime is. When someone has something against you. 
What could that be? What exactly are we talking about? Well, the context makes it clear how we can hurt each other. Look at verse 22. Anger. Strong emotion. Most likely, strong emotion acted out. Maybe violence committed against someone. Second, insult. Insult thrown at your brother or sister or neighbor. Third, saying, you fool. Empty head or whatever. Dolt, that would be the original translation. Or fourth, in verse 25, Something to do with money, betraying somebody with money, maybe a debt that you haven't paid up or a promise you haven't kept or wages that you haven't paid someone. And to be honest, the list can extend to any offense. Now, here's what I was thinking. Come on, Jesus. Saying you fool? Like, that's no biggie. That's not a big deal. Insulting somebody that's, that's serious? Come on. This is where we, as the people of God, the people of the word, humble ourselves. We don't get to decide. We don't get to decide what's sinful and not. To you, it may be nothing, and that's actually the wrong perspective to have. Because to God, it's big deal. Because every human being is an image bearer of God. And to insult and to criticize and to put down and to destroy and to demean and to lower down is to really pick your head, uh, hand on the very child of God. This is serious. How do we talk to each other? How do we talk to one another? How do we deal with each other? We don't get to decide what's right and wrong. The holiness of God tells us. But here's the thing. Uh, Jesus says this guy, he, brother, he recognizes, remembers that somebody has something against him. I want you to notice, by the way, I don't have too many points, guys. Today is one of those weird sermons. Uh, re- notice where he remembers. He remembers in an act of worship. This is huge. We are prone to be oblivious to what we are leaving behind. We are prone to be oblivious how we are in relationships. And guess where we tend to really start to remember? In worship. It is in an act of consecration. He brings a gift. This is not even required. This is just a free will offering that he decided, man, I want to give this to God and honor him. So he goes to Jerusalem, and he brings a free gift all on his own, and he's offering, and in that act of worship, he remembers. And that's not a coincidence. Come on, worshipers. Those who are devoted to Jesus, who spend time in his presence, who walk with God. Isn't it true how often you can spend time praying and the next thing you have to do is call your wife and apologize? Isn't it true how you can spend time in the word of God and the very next thing you have to do is run to your children, get on your knees and say, I am so sorry. Isn't it true how we can spend time in the presence of God and start remembering? And this, think about this right now. Maybe the Holy Spirit is bringing up relationships that are tough and tricky in your life. That you have a fallout. And you're remembering (laughs) in a place of worship. God's special graces meet us in special places. A psalmist in 139 says this. I love this. He says, search me, O God. Know my heart. You know why? Because we're not good at that. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And I have news, church, that the Holy Spirit today is doing the same for you. And he does so in prayer. He does so in the word of God. He does so in this community. He does so when we gather to take, partake of communion. God's special grace for you meets you in a special place. 
So, he's in this worship, he remembers, and he goes to reconcile. Now, I take only one piece of reconciliation I want to talk to you today about, asking for forgiveness. But reconciliation is usually more than that. It's never less than that. It always starts with asking and repenting. But I want to encourage you today to ask for forgiveness in your life. And don't even just say sorry. You know, hey, I'm sorry, man. Just been dropping the ball. Haven't been all there for you. Been messing up. No. Get real. Say the words, forgive me, and state your sin. I promise. That's what Jesus calls us to. I know what I'm saying is insanely tough, maybe. But this, this is what Jesus is calling us to reconcile now let's talk about the elephant in the room a couple of elephants in the room actually now that i think about my notes but let's think about this this is not common sense is it okay i want you to i want to paint for you a picture he's in an act of sacrificing something and he remembers and Jesus says that he ought to drop everything, go reconcile, then come back and make that sacrifice. That doesn't make any sense. How many of you are like, hey, what if like he could just kind of finish it and then reconcile? Why the interruption? Why the uncommon sense of this? The reason is because Jesus is impressing on his people the radical urgency and priority of reconciliation. Of course it could have waited, but Jesus is communicating to us that for you, it cannot wait. For you, it should not wait. That this should be your life, the daily practice of repenting before God and repenting before others. And I have conviction alert for you. Is there anything that you're delaying? Is there any reconciliation that you are called and you feel to step up to, but you're delaying? You're saying that one day I'll, I'll do it. One day I'll get to it. If we have a fallout in a relationship. Most of us, to be honest, I think this is actually true for most people. Think that one day I'll, I'll figure that out. I'll, I'll get to it. I'll, I'll talk to my mom. I'll talk to my dad. I'll talk to my you know, ex-friend. But Jesus calls us to radically prioritize this. You may not always have the opportunity. You must also consider the anguish that our deeds and words have caused someone else. We must also not forget that delay, de obedience, is also disobedience. We must realize that we're called to not delay. In fact, Jesus would give a couple of words of encouragement for why and how soon we should do this, right? We should do it ASAP. And number two, he gives some sort of um, encouragement. And look at this, these words of judgment and counsel and hell of fire. There's accountability before God that we have. Jesus says, Reconcile, 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 reconcile when, you, when you're angry, when you insult, when you call people names, when you have fallout relationships. Reconcile because God, you are ultimately accountable to God. And there is a judgment day for all. And all of us, listen, you can be anybody you want, a Buddhist, an atheist, it doesn't matter. Everybody has a relationship with God, okay? Let's just put it down. Everybody has a relationship with God because you're in, made in his image. He gave you life. He gave you breath. And everybody will get to meet God at least once. Christians get to meet God twice in this body, through faith, and then in eternity as we're welcome to his presence. But everybody gets to meet, gets to meet God. And God has a judgment day. Now, I have a question that I'm wrestling with, and I would love to hear what you maybe think in the lobby. 
But how are we to hear this being people of grace? We're saved by faith through his grace. Or we're saved by grace through his faith, through our faith. And so it's not about our works, right? We're saved because of the righteousness of Christ. And that is absolutely true. And on judgment day, you are completely and fully covered. But the people of grace heed this warning nonetheless. Okay? You're fully covered by the grace of God. But one sure sign that you're saved, one sure sign that you're following Jesus is that you heed the words of Jesus. You do not disregard it. So there's do not delay. Do not delay. I'm going to give you four quick excuses that we often make for not reconciling with one another. Let's consider this. If there was a good excuse that you could have, this brother had it. Okay, let me paint for you another picture. Okay, he's up in Galilee, 50, 60, 70 miles north of Jerusalem. Jesus tells us that at the altar, making a sacrifice, that means he travels to Jerusalem to make this gift. Okay, at least the hearers would think this way, just the way we would think if we were talking about Washington, D.C. You would think, be thinking about the travel. Okay, so in this scenario, this brother travels four or five days to Jerusalem, is mid-act, about to offer his sacrifice to the priest to make the sacrifice, remembers, okay, guys, <laughs> this is going back to Olympia on foot, okay? He's walking back to Olympia, running back, reconciling, making a second trip, basically, coming back, finishing the sacrifice, only to go back. Man, can we talk about reasons we have not to reconcile, at least not right away. There's a principle here, and here it is, hard, stern word. There's never a good reason not to reconcile. There's never a good reason not to ask for forgiveness. If there was, this brother had it. I live too far. I'll have to wait after I'm done with my trip. I know you may be thinking today, first excuse you'll be making is, Eugene, what about their 50%? I got my 50. I'm at fault, 50%. What about their 50%? Or what about, maybe it's possible, that you only own 10% of the fallout. And they own 90%. It's their fault, 90%. Can I tell you something? If you own just 1%, it is worth obeying Jesus for this. Let me ask you this question. Who is your guide in life? Is it the world or is it Jesus? If you look to the world, the world will simply echo what you already think. You're absolutely right. You shouldn't apologize. You just had a little bit to do with it. They had the big stuff to do with it. You're absolutely right. Continue on in bitterness. Continue on in a fallout until they come. You play hard to get. Now let's take our gaze away from what the world says to Jesus. And Jesus owns 0% of the fault on the cross and pays 100% of our debt. And the best part, he takes initiative. You see? Jesus, he makes the move. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us in him. He comes to his own and his own reject him. Christmas wasn't like called for. We didn't have an appointment with Jesus. He comes. He makes the move, and then he is perfect in every way without any blemish or sin. And on the cross, he pays 100% of our faults. And reconciliation that God undertakes is fully dependent on him. He takes the initiative. And so even if that 1% you own, may I gently encourage you, I know it's tough. But don't take your cue from the world. 
take your cue from your beautiful, wonderful, grace-giving, strength-providing Savior who's all initiative, zero, and takes all the blame. Amen? The second excuse you might have is, but if I start doing this, if I start this journey, they won't accept it. You know, they'll just reject me or it's just, it's, it's too hard, too tough, it's been too many years. Romans 12, 18 has a perfect line. The Bible is so beautiful. It says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I want you to catch this. We are, we are only responsible to empty our cup we are not responsible to fill someone's cup. Let me give you that example real quick. You are called to encourage. How it lands, does it land, does it actually help? I'm just called to empty my cup. That's what I'm doing. You're called to preach the gospel. Share with people. How it lands, does it land, does it close the sale, so to speak? Does it, they really come to know Jesus? No, no, they will never do that. No, 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 no. You're only responsible to empty your cup, not fill theirs. And same thing in reconciliation. Your part in all of this is to offer your 1%, whatever. I keep saying 1%. I'm going to stop. That was last time. Offer whatever part you have in this. Offer it up. You're not called to necessarily seal the deal. That might not actually happen, but as much as it depends on you, that you would do so. Number three, that it's really, really hard or it's awkward. There's a lot of pain involved or it's just plain awkward to reconcile. May I encourage you with something? You ever watch extreme sports? That's all I'm allowed to do. Albina and I have this agreement. It's more like a command from her, to be honest. And that's until we have these kiddos, four of them, no extreme sports for us. It's a good excuse because I don't have <laughs> the courage to do any of it. But when I do watch the thrill of bungee jumping, squirrel suit flying, parachute jumping, climbing you know, a cliff without anything, right? Man, the thrill, right? At least... I, I look at that, I'm like, well, that's amazing. That's exciting. Come on, church, don't be judging me. I, I want to tell you, yeah, it might be hard. It might be awkward. But there is the best thrill you'll ever experience is to be fully devoted, with full abandon, without regard for any restraint, completely devoted to Christ. And that includes this step of reconciliation. I, I, listen, this is what I hope for you, okay? This is what I was imagining that some of you, maybe this week, will do the impossible. And you'll meet with somebody, maybe for coffee, and you'll share, and then you'll, you'll cry or whatever, and then you'll get in your car and you'll put your hands on your head and you'll say, what did I just do? And you just did something awesome. The greatest thrill of our lives is to live full abandon for his sake. Listen, it's not in me. It's not in you. Those resources, they come from him. But just throw yourself at the cross. And I promise, I promise, there will be a mercy night you'll share this at because it's so beautiful. So it might be hard. It might be awkward. But it is so beautiful. The fourth one, fourth excuse is that you might say, well, Eugene, I do not feel it, and I like to be sincere. I'm not really feeling this, and, you know, I don't want to have, like, say something I don't actually mean. Let's talk about this. This is so key, about feelings. Um, if you're going to wait on feelings, you will sacrifice obedience. Nothing in life, nothing that's worth doing something, um, it's controlled by feelings, right? The reality is, church, is that in each and every one of us is a war of desires. We are all conflicted. The Bible calls 
two sides that we all have, and that is we have the Spirit and its desire. His desire is that we would honor and do the will of God. And in our same heart and in us lives a different set of desires, the fleshly desires. And the fleshly desires war against godly desires. Check this out. And we often think that sincerity means not having any conflicting desires. It's when our flesh cooperates. And that just cannot be. Sincerity is not when we don't have conflicting desires and just everything's just perfect and lined up and I just want to offer this apology or forgiveness, repentance to somebody. Sincerity is when you obey the voice of the Spirit in you in midst of all the desires that war against it. Sincerity is not the absence of conflicting desires. Sincerity is when you lean in and obey the desires of your new being inside of you, new creation, the new spirit within you, your new heart that God has given you, even though you have conflicting desires. I want to encourage you, church, not to be waiting on whatever that thing means, but just obey. Despite having anger, despite it looking messy, but at the end of the day, you are obeying the Spirit. Amen? But I love this most important. If I had to give you one reason, one reason why you should do this, I want to talk to you about what we see in this text, and that is the two relationships we see in verse 23 and 24. There's a God relationship here. That's the vertical relationship that we all have. It is a relationship between humans and God. You see that this brother comes to the temple to offer a sacrifice to God. And interspersed into that relationship is the horizontal relationship we have with each other. And I'll be closing right now. With each other. And here's the thing, if we can go back. We have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with everybody else, and we love to separate the two. We love to have our relationship with God be one thing and our relationship with somebody else be another thing. And we, that is I, love it this way. Because I get to honor God and dishonor what well, depends how they behave, people. I get to worship God, but I don't have to get along with anybody. I get to have a good relationship with God. He's awesome. He's amazing. He blesses me. But I don't have to bless anybody else. And we love to compartmentalize our relationships. Like God is one thing and people are another thing. And yet what we see, what we see, what we see is that in Scripture, time and time again, we could do a whole Bible study where our relationship with God is interconnected with our relationship with others. In Hosea 6.6, 6, God says this, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That's what God wants. He's saying real worship looks like this. I want mercy and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. You cannot give mercy to God. So clearly what God is saying here is what I want, what I desire, what true worship is, it's not just sacrifices to me, but it is mercy shown to your fellow beings. It is reconciliation and peace with other beings. And what we're seeing here is not just that they're, they're two different relations, but they're one and the same. Apostle Paul persecuted the church, okay? Before he became Apostle Paul, he was Saul. He was going to Damascus. God meets him. And, why, and, and he's going to Damascus to persecute Christians. And he meets Jesus supernaturally. And Jesus says these words. You ready? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul could have said, Jesus, I'm persecuting people. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Why are you persecuting me? Because God so identifies with his people 
that our relationship with God includes our relationship with others. Our relationship with God, I didn't put this on there, often depends on our relationship with others. Jesus says, if you do not forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive. And I think that some of you here are wondering why you are not growing. You've hit a certain ceiling in your growth. And you're wondering, how come I'm not experiencing more of God? I would surely love to. How come I don't experience his presence as much as I would want to? How come this Bible reads to me so, so um, numbly? Why am I so numb? It may be because you're holding on to something as serious as having a fallout with people in your life, especially people in the church. Some of you have compromised worship. The whole point of this text is that he would reconcile with his brother and come back and worship God. But if he didn't do that, his worship would be not accepted. It would be inadequate. God would say, you, I want to worship you, God, I want to desire you, but God all along is saying, but I desire true worship, and true worship is make peace. This passage doesn't show us that God is number two and people are number one. This passage expands the true meaning of having God at one. This passage doesn't sideline worship and make people more important. This passage is about expanding our understanding of worship to be worshiping God through adoring him and worshiping God through obeying his word as he instructed us to reconcile with one another. It's all worship. It's all beautiful worship to God. It's part of our praise. It's part of our relationship with him that we reconcile. So I want to be praying with you right now. You know, one of my favorite things at making sermon series is although I pray about it and I sit down and I dry it all out, I'm never perfect and far from it, but I love how sermons just line up unplanned on the right day. Today is communion Sunday. And we're coming to the table. And in 1 Corinthians 11, Brother Vlad is going to be reading in just a moment. Paul instructs the hearers that they would examine themselves. And what they would be examining precisely is evaluating how maybe perhaps they've been hurting other Christians. And part of this process is that you would reconcile, that you would come forth and make peace with them as you take communion. So I have a challenge for you today. Now, you might say, well, Pastor Eugene, depending on the story, I should be running out of this church, going to the parking lot, peeling out, zooming on 405, coming to my person, and like we would all just run away right now, right? So the principle is here, okay? I, have, I want to challenge you, church, to do something impossible with God's grace, absolutely possible. By next Sunday, that you would make that phone call. By next Sunday, you would set up that coffee date next Sunday. And out of you and out of your mouth would proceed full abandon, throwing yourself at the mercy and grace of God. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Mom, here's what I've done. Here's how I've been. I'm sorry. Dad, or your wife, you take on a date, your husband, your friend, your child, that you would initiate this process of reconciliation. And I have another challenge, that as you partake of communion, that you would be partaking in this commitment. Obviously, nobody's running away. But as you take this communion, you are on the hook 
to take a step. Now, this is not for everybody. Not everybody finds themselves in these relationships. But I know God leads me this way to say this, that there's some of you, you know exactly who comes to mind that you would take those steps. Fully abandoned to Jesus for his glory. You will experience God's presence. You will experience God's goodness. You will experience what it means to live life, surrender to Jesus. I can tell you, and there's so much beauty, and there's so much of letting go, and there's so much healing in all of this. And it is not easy, but it is commanded by our incredible Savior. Let me pray for you.